Okay, uh, let's begin. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Da Yan, the program co-chair of BioKDD 2020. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the BioKDD 2020 workshop. Today, we have four sessions, each with five to six talks of 15 minutes each, with seven invited talks and 22 talks in total. You should have received the attendees checklist file that contains a link to our workshop program. You can also find the program link in our chat room. Without any further delay, let's welcome our general chair, Dr. Jake Chen, to give the opening remarks. Hi, Jake. It's your turn. I see Jake is muted. Let me see you. Uh, uh, Dr. Chen, can, can you uh, unmute Jake? I see he is muted. Uh, I can't. Oh, okay. I can only ask people to unmute, but I cannot unmute for them. Uh, I see. Yeah. Well, let, 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 me, let me see. So may, maybe because uh, I think uh, Jake will uh, join maybe later. Uh, let's uh, postpone the open remarks to, to in the middle of session one and session two, maybe. So I think uh, 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 let's maybe let's begin session one uh, bioinformatics. Uh, Dr. Hong Qing uh, will be uh, the session chair. So I will give control to Dr. Qing. Thank you. Okay, then uh, can everybody hear me? Hello. Okay. Good. So I'm. Uh, I will uh, start with uh, session one, the bioinformatics. Uh, uh, it's quite an honor to be here. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Qian Huaxin, an associate professor from the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, I think he's in the uh, Department of uh, Computational System Biology and Physics. Uh, I'm going to let him and his work speak for himself. Uh, uh, do you want to share your slides? Uh, yes. Can you allow me to do that? I I think I have. Can you try to see uh, whether you can share your Yes, slides? I cannot start uh, sharing while others participating is sharing. Oh, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> let me stop my sharing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me. Okay. Can you hear? Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's good. good. Okay. Probably I'll just start. Uh, first, like thanks for the organizer for inviting me to give this talk. So um, today I would like to share some of our recent efforts on reconstructing cell phenotypic transition dynamics from single cell data. So we know. Cells, they may have to share the same set of genome, but can exist in different phenotypes. They are morphologically, physiologically, functionally very different. Um, cells can exist in different states, and also there can be conversion between different phenotypes, like during the developmental process, an embryo will develop into different cell uh, types. Uh, during the process, actually, uh, cells need to converge between this uh, tightly bound epithelial cells to this uh, loosely bound, more mobile mesenchymal phenotypes. So this is a process called the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, EMT, and the reverse is MET. So this process uh, also uh, involved in many other physiological processes like a wound healing and also uh, involved in uh, like a pathological process like cancer metastasis, fibrosis, there are a lot of research on this topic. Here I only list a few papers from my lab. Uh, another example is the cell reprogramming. You know, terminally differential cells like fibroblasts can be reprogrammed into induced pluripotent stem cells, which can then induce to uh, other phenotypes like uh, cardiomyocyte, or there'll be direct conversion between, like say, fibroblasts and cardiomyocyte. 
So clearly you see cell reprogramming has a very important biomedical applications. And also it suggests that one can manipulate cell phenotype. Therefore, we want to control cell phenotypes. For this purpose, quantitative understanding of cell phenotype regulation will be very helpful. So for this, one thing we need to know is that we need a quantitative description of cell state, like where it is now and where it will go next. So let's consider a toy model. We have two genes that interact with each other. So the dynamics, the dynamics will be governed by the set of uh, uh, mathematical, mathematical equations. And then you see the variable x1, x2 are the expression of genes, which can be measured experimentally. So dx1, dt, dx2, dt, those form a vector field that contains in, uh, regulatory information. So I've shown here, for given state with x1, x2, there's be a vector that tells, okay, where uh, and, and how fast uh, this cell will move next. So we can see, um, you start from anywhere, the cells can converge into three stable attractors that's corresponding stable um, phenotypes. So if we know the vector field, we'll know information of the regulation and we uh, can give an insight how we can control the, uh, the, spread, uh, the process. For example, if we start from X1, then it can differentiate into X3 or X2. So if we um, suppress X2, so we'll bias X1 go to this X2. Um, Another example is if suppose we start at three, so we see we can first activate X, X1, then we suppress X2, that will reprogram S3 to S2 through this pathway. Alternatively, we can first uh, suppress X2, then increase X1, then the system will still also uh, reprogram the S2, but follow another pathway. Well, all this seems very uh, just transparent, but think about the cells. Uh, there are tens of uh, thousands of uh, genes that interact with each other from a very complex network. Therefore, if we know the genome-wide vector field, it will be very informative. So how can we reconstruct re genome-wide vector field? It requires a lot of experimental input. Recently, there is a very important advance in single-cell genomics called the RNA velocity. We know when we uh, measure do uh, a single cell RNA measurements, we have to destroy the cells. Therefore, only can get a snapshot of the cell state. While well, those researchers they show actually we can get a little more about the dynamics. It means how and what, uh, the direction and how fast it will go next. The idea is like this: suppose we have a gene that it will uh, first transcribe to unsupplied mRNA, then to supplied mRNA eventually uh, the MRA will be degraded. So notice that unsupplied, unsupplied MRA can be read out directly from the environment. And also uh, there are ways we can estimate this uh, uh, constants. Then one can estimate this DSDT. Uh, it's called the RNA velocity. So here shows the example from the original study. So here's a neural differentiation. So you see, those vectors. So that shows uh, the direction of uh, the cell will move during the, uh, during the differentiation process. Um, we have uh, generalized the process so we can do estimate uh, our velocity from different RNA, uh, dis different uh, types of uh, the data, single cell data. And we have released a package called the Dynamo. You can download from here. And this work uh, is, was done by two very, uh, very uh, talented and uh, uh, creative, uh, motivated uh, young researcher, uh, Xiao Jie Chu from Johnson Weissman Lab and the uh, Westside Institute, and my student Yan Zhang. So we also specifically we um, introduced a single cell stem seek into our velocity estimation. So in this method. Um, it will measure the RNA-MRA turnover dynamics directly through metabolic labeling. 
Therefore, we get a better estimation of the R velocity. So we compare different uh, methods. For example, here shows it's, uh, suppose you have, uh, you got uh, your data from 10X platform. That means you can get a lot of, a lot of single cell data. You really can get a quite good estimation of the R velocity. But this method also very sensitive to the sample size. If you decrease sample size, then the result becomes more noisier. Um, here, if we have the same sample size, then we show that single cell uh, stem seek measurement can show significant improvement over the original intra electron based estimation. Um, so now we have, uh, uh, we have uh, the uh, velocity. Let's see if we can uh, reconstruct uh, the uh, vector field. Here is a generic uh, uh, dynamic equations like a dx dt equals fx and some noise term. F is a nonlinear multi-dimensional vector function. So X is just the gene expression. So we see dx, dt, and X can be measured or derived from single cell data. Then it becomes a machine learning problem to, to learn this function F. So this is, uh, we have developed a pipeline for the vector value to take on of regularization of vector field reconstruction in reproducing kernel Hilbert space in spar with sparse matrix approximation. But don't worry about this because all this can uh, take care by our package. And underlying mass actually is not that complicated. So consider a set of uh, data and we can do linear regression, right? To get a linear fit. Or we can add a little more terms, x square, x cube terms to get a nonlinear fit. So here we have this one x, x two, x cube, all things. These are the basis functions, um, actually form a, a Hilbert space. Then the, fa the fitting actually is just a linear regression. So we can generalize the process to be use the basis function, um, not just the, the polynomial, but other function forms. Then uh, still it's a, because a linear regression problem, we should determine this coefficient. So um, actually I show here as a, as a note I wrote many years ago, uh, it's on the Hilbert space, it's a different context. But the key thing here is, uh, with this procedure, eventually we got an analytical form of the vector field in high dimensional space. In practice, we really found that 20 to 30 principal component mode would be sufficient to de uh, describe the uh, system dynamics. And each PC mode is defined by a large number of genes, let's say 2,000, 3,000. And with the form, it will allow further analysis using some dynamical system theory, differential geometry, other things. Um, there, you may have found a lot of examples and discussions in our package. Um, so here shows an example, like um, this is a synthetic data to demonstrate the, the methodology. So we have, first we have some very sparse, uh, noisy data, but still we can reconstruct a smooth uh, vector field and see these attractors. So here is an, another set of data analyzed by my postdoc, Wei Kang and Dante, a student Dante. Uh, so this, um, this TGF beta treated human A549 cells. It will undergo EMP. So this is, is the, the vector field that obtained. And uh, the background color is for the Vimington expression. Vimington is a marker for messing chemo cells. So with the uh, information, they can run uh, trajectory simulations to show, okay, a cell start from epithelial cells, then uh, eventually go to massive hemo cells. So they run many uh, trajectories. They can cluster the trajectory in two groups based on their similarity. So they found for each group, uh, it's mainly follow, one group is mainly follow one, this path along the PC1 uh, direction, while another path well, first go up to PC2, then uh, follow this, uh, this path. Okay, so this is a very interesting result because it reminds us another project we can has done. So he also used human A5 for nine cells, but with a endogenous Vimington RFP labeling. And here it shows this, uh, see the cells. So uh, before and after TGI beta treatment cells show dramatic morphology change, and also Vimington expression and texture change. So we quantify the morphology using this active shape model is what used, commonly used in computer image analysis. 
into this 296 dimension feature and also by maintained by these hierarchical features uh, in 13 dimensions. So then we have this uh, integrated lifestyle imaging quantitative image analysis procedure. The mainly we do continuous time-lapse imaging of the cells for a couple of days. Then we do cell segmentation and tracking. We extract individual uh, cells of individual uh, uh, features of individual cells, and you can represent cell state in this composite 309 dimensional feature space. So each cell uh, trajectory or form, you know, form a trajectory in this uh, feature space, then we can do some further analysis. So uh, the key thing in this step is this uh, uh, image analysis because of a huge amount of image we have to rely on automated single cell segmentation. So we have developed this deep convolutional neural network based uh, analysis and the details can be found in this paper. So here I show you a uh, typical example, a uh, typical cell. So see that the yellow is the Wyminton. So the, uh, it is over two days of imaging. So it changed over uh, the, both the shape and the, the experiment expression. So we extract the feature and then we can check the cell shape and also all the feature in this uh, uh, composite space. This is, uh, uh, this is a, a morphology, PC1 space, uh, PC1, and this Vimitian uh, hierarchy uh, PC1. So for this cell, we got a single cell trajectories. Um, so here um, shows the two typical trajectories, and we have many, and we class them, class them in two clusters based on their similarity. So one group, they uh, follow this mean, mean path, so first very Wyminton, then morphology. Another one is concerted the change of Wyminton and the morphology. So this becomes very interesting because see, we from live cell uh, studies and the snapshot single cell studies, we both found the two types of trajectory. Then the question asks is, uh, there a correspondence between these two types of trajectory? This is a question currently Wei Kang and Dante are working on. So this also summarizes a uh, uh, take home message that is uh, in our study through a uh, combined live cell and the fixed cell data analysis, we are uh, trying, aiming at, we can map out the transition path of a cell phenotype transition process. And our ultimate goal is that we can control the cells, which path take and also which cell fit to end up with. So I have already um, uh, mentioned a few people leading, uh, mainly involved in the project here is more complete list. So this, uh, this project is really in collaboration with a few uh, colleagues. So mainly it's the Jonathan Weissman lab at the uh, White Side Institute. My colleague Yvette Bahar, who co-authorized uh, Yen uh, uh, with me, and also uh, Simon Watkins, uh, 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 Wei Guo from ATCC, and uh, Chan Zuckerberg uh, Bellhub, and also other fellow colleagues uh, who also participate in the project in various aspects and funding agency. So I'll just stop here for questions. Thank you. There are questions for Dr. Chen Huangxin. People can also send a question through the chat, uh, make it very clear. Uh, I have a question. Mm. It's a very nice talk, and but I missed the first part. So you think uh, you take into account both eyes? I, I mean, like uh, gene expression and the splicing. The when you deal with uh, single cell eye seeker, is it right? Yeah, that's uh, by the way. This is not uh, this one is not our work. It's okay. another lab. Yeah. Yeah. So normally when when people do like a uh, splicing analysis, which requires much more in depth, I mean, like uh, the, the yeah. sequence depth. That's so, can we use a traditional, like a single cell eye seq to do, or you have a, a more higher requirement for the depths? Uh, I think that's a good question. Definitely requires the depths. Um, from, from our analysis, we think that uh, most of uh, the uh, data up in there, the variety can good some estimation, a good estimation of the velocity. So I think for this technical thing, 
um, you can try our package. And if you have any question, by the way, if you have any question in, on this, feel free to send us an email. And uh, uh, especially those two uh, young people, they will uh, give you, uh, you know, address those questions. Thank you. I also have a question. Mm -hmm. So, um, is there, so by just staring at the live image of the cells, can I also, like, is it so obvious to predict a trajectory that maybe I don't need to use, don't need to use your software? Or ah. like, does your software so, solve something that is very non-trivial to find without using it? You're talking about the life side imaging, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's a good question. So see, by doing quantitative, you know, this morphology, for example, have been, have been already traditional used in biology as a, as a supplement to their expression study of things. What I show here by, uh, show here by quantify those information that we can get more subtle, uh, subtle things that, that help. So um, that's for this way. Definitely, you know, for very dramatic phenotype change, you know, uh, differentiating to different phenotypes, you already can see by, just by your eyes, see, see all those uh, uh, dramatic change, even here, right, here. But with quantification, that can give you more subtle information. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Why did you use a convolutional neural network for learning instead of using a feed-forward network? Can you say it again? You mean the segmentation con part? Yeah, you used a neural network for learning, right? You used convolutional neural network, right? Uh -huh. Why uh -huh. didn't you use feed for one network? Can you give some detail? Ah, well, uh, well, this is one network we use to find it useful. Um, definitely, one can also test um, other types of method. I think my my post we comes here. He, I, I forgot if whether he has tried others. He, he he might be able to address this question. Okay. Uh... I think, uh, yeah, we, you can use different framework. Uh, here I use uh, VGG16 for at the uh, backend network. And, and the, here we just modify the object we're learning. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and combine with the watershed function. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely you can try other uh, structure, network structure. Uh, I also have a question. Uh, uh, so, I, uh, if I recall, the, the velocity method work on uh, from uh, unspliced to spliced only, mm -hmm. but some uh, uh, species their RNA have very little intron. How, how would you deal with that? <laughs> that? That's exactly why we, you know, we, we, we talk about other methods like this, uh, 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 slam seek things that can, can bypass this uh, limitation. Yeah, I, 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 we talk about this, right? You are yeast, that right, yeah, can yeah. be a problem. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And even for species, there are genes, right? Some genes have more intron, uh, some uh, don't have. So you may have unbalanced uh, uh, estimation of those different genes. Right, yeah. yeah. But, uh, I guess if I, if I follow up for the shape, how do you link to the RNA? Ah, I mean, yeah. The, the, you... the, the second yeah. one, the second one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how ah. do you... Uh, that this is a good question, right? This is something we are working on right now. We hopefully we can. Um, as, wait, the, the goal is we can establish some uh, correspondence. Mm -hmm. There are several prominent studies they show that morphology uh, mm -hmm. really can reflect the underlying cell state. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's I think 2003 there's a science paper, and recently there's several other studies 
uh, most recent there's uh, um, even um, uh, Dennis Wirth has a science of once paper to show this, you know, can more fully reflect cell metastasis uh, potential. So all this does really suggest, you know, there is essentially just a different representation of cell state. So we are uh, in the process trying to make the connection. Therefore, we can be able to, to, to uh, uh, track information by combining the two methods. Uh so uh, one critique from this RNA uh, network uh, uh, analysis, how do you know what's the cause? What's the, what, what is the driver? What's, what's the cause? What's the consequence, uh, I guess? Yeah. Cause and consequence. Yeah. Right, yeah. Like, I mean, you, we, we, we see a, a phenotype, we see the uh, RNA pattern. How, some people, I, I, you might, because uh, some people will say, how do you know that's the causal? <laughs> so, uh -huh. Yeah, that, that, that's a group. I, I think that requires further uh, for that study, right? And th if you have those information, first give you some hypothesis, mm -hmm. then in order to really elicit, well, there may be some correlation, right? So you can be further, uh, further analysis to, to, to test on this. I see. I have uh, another question. Mm -hmm. um, so here you have a framework to infer the, say, the false field in the gene expression space. For, I can imagine maybe you are thinking about having the gene expression measurement from different time points. Yes. Is that right? And then, so there are some like similar studies, for example, like Warrington OT or other methods, like trying to use the different time points to infer the uh, the differentiation, uh, differentiation trajectory of the cells. Yes. And uh, can you compare the different approach or like why you think your approach might, or where this pro approach will perform better? No, we didn't say our approach will perform better. We just say, you know, probably this procedure will help to extract more information, right? So this is important, right? So see, uh, in this uh, uh, table already show, uh, we take in count uh, experiments can be done in different platform, different design. You have time course or no time course. We we try to see how with this we can uh, help to to uh, kind of estimate uh, those dynamic information. Uh, that's one thing. And also in terms of uh, trajectory inference, I want to say you know currently most of our trajectory information uh, uh, algorithm haven't really taken into account this dynamic information. I know uh, uh, Fabian has some reason to have a work on that. Uh, so, you know, suppose with additional information out the where it goes, right, this can give you uh, some uh, more, more uh, give you more, more uh, input for the trajectory, for the trajectory inference. That's also something I, uh, we are trying to work on. I show you some, right, the EMT one, show you some example. Here you have a lot of parameters, and you can imagine that for different MRA, the kinetics can be different. So you have a lot more parameters. Can you imagine how you can fix all these parameters within the available data? Uh, that's a good question. Let me see. Yen, do you have any sort on this? I'm trying to ask my student, Yen. Sorry, what was the question? Uh, yeah, and he, he asked for in the parameter, how, how the parameter uh, estimation uh, may affect result, how we can uh, somehow try to constrain the parameters. Um, I mean, there, yeah, there are many parameters involved um, and there, there are many steps. So I guess for, uh, for calculating velocity, um, uh, we'll sh so first of all, we use a, s a default set of parameters, which should work for most of the data. But in, in the case where you find uh, some abnormal um, velocity, then you can tune those parameters uh, and see if it fits your prior uh, information. Um, and there is also another step where you project those velocities onto a low dimensional embedding. So again, the default parameters should work. Uh, 
But then there are, of course, cases where you need to change, for example, the width of a Gaussian kernel and so on to make the velocity look smoother on a uh, embedding and so on. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, uh, thanks, you have for a great talk. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Reed Thompson. Dr. Thompson, are you here? I am indeed. Can you guys hear me? Great, yes. So, uh, well, Dr. Reed Thompson is a system professor of biomedical engineering at the Oregon Health and Science University. And he will talk about us, uh, talk, uh, his talk is about the SARS CoV 2. Uh, well, I'm going to let him uh, take over. All right. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing, and uh, Dr. Thomas, you should be able to start sharing your slide. We can see it. You can you can go to the slideshow, I think. It works. Can you guys still hear me? Yes, yeah, it's all yours. Perfect, okay. Um, my, only, my only quick um, apology up front, and I very much appreciate this opportunity, um, is uh, <laughs> that I may have some connectivity issues uh, today, unfortunately. Um, but I'm very much looking forward to speaking with you guys. If there's anything that you missed, please don't hesitate to um, uh, send me a, send something in the chat. I'll try to rewind to the slide and make sure that we don't miss anything. Uh, but anyway, the title of my talk is Human Leukocyte Antigen or HLA Susceptibility Map for SARS-CoV-2. Um, the outline of this talk, and uh, certainly in terms of disclosures, I don't have anything specific to disclose that's relevant here, uh, but my lab's pre-existing research into cancer new antigens, I just wanna give a very short background so you guys understand where I'm coming from. Um, uh, then diving a little bit into the main hypothesis here, which is viral antigen presentation variability as a function of HLA, and then focusing specifically on our findings in COVID. Um, so for purposes of background, um, uh, this is a overall schematic of tumor neantigen presentation via the uh, um, uh, endogenous or MHC class one uh, antigen presentation pathway. So um, there's a whole bunch of proteins that normally get broken down through the proteasome, um, uh, and then ultimately, um, processed through a series of transporters, et cetera, and uh, shuttled to the cell surface for uh, immune surveillance and potentially immune recognition. Um, in the case of um, our exist the lab's existing research to date, uh, we've really focused on cancer in your antigens, so any uh, mutation-derived peptides um, that may be recognized as abnormal could potentially be cleared by the immune system as an anti-cancer immune response. And again, that's the, the overall quick schematic that you're seeing here. Um, uh, my lab has done a lot of work um, in this space, specifically uh, looking at uh, predictive tools um, uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, translating from a mutation or a, a set of mutations in a given cancer to the actual uh, potential neapotopes that may arise on the cell surface um, for a given cancer and maybe immunogenic. Um, our flagship software is called Neeposcope, uh, and what you're seeing here is just a schematic of the field overall. It is certainly a quite a crowded space. A lot of people are doing work in this space, and it's an exciting space, but there's a lot of pros and cons to all the different uh, software and tools that are available. I'm not going to dive into the details here. Obviously, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to address. Um, but we were motivated to develop um, software in this space and do work in this space by uh, substantial and many critical gaps in the tools that were available. Um, and I'm just gonna move on uh, in the interest of time today. The other key component to doing this work is that um, uh, you know, antigens may be presented differentially depending upon an individual's HLA type. The HLA, uh, in this case, human leukocyte antigen again, um, there, there are numerous different alleles that do uh, a lot of the antigen presentation. In this case, we're looking at just the MHC class one pathway where there are three main alleles, the HLA A, B, and C loci that um, are able to bind to peptides and shuttle them to the cell surface. What you're seeing here is a, a, a funny cartoon, but I think it illustrates the point of how you can have very different flavors of peptides that are presented to the cell surface as a function of the different HLA types. And so you see, for instance, HLA A is presenting a totally different cuisine of a chicken and different pieces of a chicken uh, than HLA B and HLA C. 
Um, and you can see below the, inter uh, the internal cell kind of processing, where you go from chicken through chopping in the proteasome to sending out the different peptides with differential affinity to these different um, uh, HLA classes. And then this little policeman overall, this cytotoxic T lymphocyte, uh, seeing what, what, they're, what they're recognizing. Um, here is a bit more detail there, just showing that there is a significant sequence specificity to uh, different HLA types, not just as a class, but actually even within class. So this is different HLA-C molecules. And you see the kind of major and minor allele designations. For instance, the top left, you see HLA-C0202, and at the bottom right, you see HLA-C0802. And you can recognize that the actual kind of logo, the sequence logo for what that particular HLA type generally recognizes or is more prone to recognizing is different in each of the cases of these different alleles. And so we know that because there's wide variability in the individual locus, then there's wide variability in potential antigen presentation as a function of um, uh, different HLA class as well as um, different a a HLA uh, major and minor little subtypes. So rewind several years now, or at least a year or so, I would say, um, I got interested in thinking about the HLA variability and antiviral immune response. And this came from personal experience in my family where the same cold kind of knocked a few of us out of commission and, and then others of us just got through with little sniffles, right? So it was essentially the same bug ostensibly because we, you know, it was communicated uh, within the family. Uh, and yet we had very, very drastically different uh, courses of infection. Um, and obviously there's lots of reasons why that could be the case. My main hypothesis, especially kind of seeing where it's coming from with all this HLA related variability in cancer uh, um, uh, epitopes presentation um, was that HLA variability was giving rise to differential severity of the actual colds that we had. And was this directly testable in the context of my family? Well, obviously not. Uh, but if you look at the prior, uh, a body of prior literature, and that's what I did at that time, um, you can see that there's a, 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 actually a well-established space. This is not a, 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 you know, a completely harebrained concept um, that indeed for, for multiple different viruses, different um, studies have shown class associations for A, B, and C alleles in class one, even for class two and three HLA types um, uh, or MHC uh, classes rather. Um, there, there's a number of different studies and these numbers here in this table are showing the number of studies that show uh, some sort of association with a, uh, a, a specific type or types uh, for a given HLA and that viral infection. It's been well studied in the context of HIV, but um, multiple other viruses as well. Uh, and in fact, um, that then kind of led me to think, well, maybe this is a good avenue of research for the lab. Um, and that's what uh, one of my graduate students is mainly focusing on, um, but largely looking at uh, HLA and viral outcomes. And there was a lot of publicly available data sets that we potentially leverage. Of course, what happens? Well, there's a global pandemic. I mean, I wasn't planning for a pandemic, no one was, uh, but um, early in uh, this year, it became very clear that this was a major issue uh, and that there were a lot of unanswered questions like why, for instance, are some people asymptomatic and others dying? Very much akin to um, at least the, 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 the very quick little kind of personal observation of, of uh, different um, uh, root of severity in terms of a cold. And again, this hypothesis cropped up, but very clearly in this case related to COVID, could HLA type variability influence COVID disease susceptibility and transmissibility? And the challenge in this case was that this was very early in the pandemic and how the heck could we investigate this without actual clinical data? Um, acknowledging that clinical data was gonna be disparate across the world, long time to come, um, challenging to standardize, to get deep information, et cetera. So we really started this from a question and from a, from a perspective of not having clinical data. But we did have a bunch of other resources. And so what resources did we have? Well, firstly, um, there was already very early in the year, um, the publication of a SARS-CoV-2 viral genome uh, and, co and concomitant proteome. And this was just a Twitter uh, announcement for the um, existence of that, um, or the publication of that, that genome um, coming out of the first patient, pa the first, the first patients from Wuhan. Uh, and um, this was uh, January 10th. So very, very early on that was there. The other thing we had was um, an existing resource in uh, through the NCBI, so NCBI virus, where there is a compendium of other viral genomes and proteomes that had already been published, not just from, um, you know, um, uh, for instance, uh, related SARS virus, but actually from a number of other coronaviruses both affecting humans and not, and a number of other viruses, broadly speaking. So we were able to leverage that information uh, as well. 
uh, we also had been for a while working with a number of MHC binding affinity prediction tools, which are of course a, a critical component of being able to do this in silico type of work. And then we had substantial compute resources uh, uh, at Oregon Health and Science University. Um, our personal cluster is called ExaCloud, but really, you know, the, it, it's just uh, our local compute instance that allowed us to do this work, um, as well as a capacity to work, work remotely, right? I mean, when we're doing pre purely in silico analyses, uh, we were able to do this work even in a socially distanced uh, fashion, even though the whole institution had been shut down. Um, so finally, you know, I have to owe all this work to a great team of people. And here's just a picture of the folks in the lab. So what did we do? What did we look at here? Well, uh, firstly, we looked across the entire SARS-CoV-2 proteome, uh, and we wanted to predict HLA binding affinity um, across the whole proteome. And so what we did was we first looked at, um, at least via class one, we looked at HLA, um, oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, we looked at uh, viral camers that were between eight to 12 amino acids in size. So really we, did, we basically looked across the entire proteome, camerized it in these small windows and found about 48 or so thousand um, unique peptide sequences. We then filtered these sequences for antigen processing, presuming right that if this is gonna get to the cell surface, that it needs to actually be processed and presented. And so we, we used some of the, the tools for this, an example being NetShop, to make sure that among those overall camers, they would actually be feasibly presentable um, for, um, for the immune system. And then what we did was across 145 different HLA types, A, B, and C, um, we uh, predicted um, Kamer binding affinities. So we did that uh, for approximately 4.7 million peptide and HLA pairs. And we found that there were about 40,000 or so high affinity pairs, high affinity in this case being defined as less than 500 nanomolar in terms of binding affinity. And there was an approximately uniform distribution of these um, uh, uh, binders essentially across the virus. What you're seeing here in the schematic to the right, you see the, um, the A, B, and C alleles, and the x-axis here being the viral, um, the viral proteome. So you see at the bottom kind of the, the different um, uh, regions of the virus um, where proteins would be coming from. You have, for instance, um, the ORF1AB, which is a, the main component. Uh, the, in terms of size of the virus, but obviously spike protein, nuclear membrane, et cetera, and nucleocapsid membrane protein, et cetera. Um, and those are uh, across A, B, and C, as I said, A being green, B being in orange, and C being in purple. And you see that that's the number of camers for, that are being presented across the different components of the virus. Obviously, there are places where there's more and less, but overall, there's no substantial trend here. Um, okay. We then looked um, at individual variability. So we said for an individual HLA type, how many uh, peptides may be presented from this virus and how therefore good or bad would a given uh, HLA type be at presenting a fraction of the virus. And so you see here um, on the right, you see a so-called waterfall plot of different HLA types. Uh, each HLA allele is a single row here in this plot. Um, and you see from top going down, you see those alleles that are more or less associated with um, uh, high level presentation. So the top is showing to the right, the extent of SARS-CoV-2 presentation. And at the bottom, you see there's very, very little. The alleles at the bottom are presenting almost none of SARS-CoV-2. To the left, you're just looking at the global allele frequency. And so what, one thing we do know is that really there's um, not a substantial relationship between how common an allele is in the population and how good or bad it is at actually presenting um, peptides from SARS-CoV-2. Um, anyway, you look here at three example genes, uh, three example alleles, one each for A, B, and C um, of quote unquote good um, uh, types, where for instance, HLA A0202 is predicted to present 21% of the entire SARS-CoV-2 presentable proteome, whereas a, 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 the, a bad allele would be like HLA A2501 that's only able to present 0.2. So, literally two orders of magnitude, fewer alleles, uh, fewer peptides from the SARS-CoV-2 proteome. Same type of deal for HLA-C and HLA-B. So you said, well, that's all well and good, but do we have any kind of gold standard here? Obviously, we didn't have any immune responses versus SARS-CoV-2, but SARS-CoV-1 um, essentially, right? SARS-CoV was um, uh, around uh, about a decade prior and a little more than that actually. And um, there are actual clinical outcomes that we know from that experience. And so what we did was we repeat this analysis 
basically, you know, word for word or point for point using SARS-CoV. And we looked and found that HLA-B4601 was pretty much the worst, at least from our predictions, about presenting um, alleles from SARS. And what we found was another study that actually, you know, validated that data essentially. It's not a, 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 an exact clinical replicate of, of this, but it is certainly a kind of a proof of principle showing that the clinical data from the SARS epidemic in 2003 demonstrated a HLA-B4601 association with disease severity. Um, and, um, you know, there are a number of other studies showing mixed different things, but we found this to be very, very uh, intriguing. Again, it's suggestive more than, than proving in any way, shape, or form, but, um, you know, it was the best that we were able to do at the time. Uh, in terms of um, a broader picture, right, an individual is not just a single allele, but rather a compendium of alleles all smushed together into an organism. And in fact, there are six different A, B, and C alleles generally that an individual may have. So 2A, 2B, 2C, um, uh, presuming, of course, a diploid genome. Um, and uh, what we see when we look at the presentation of SARS, uh, CoV-2, across, um, you know, uh, putative in whole individual or whole haplotype um, uh, alleles or whole, whole haplotypes, what we find is a distribution, of course, of different presentation largely anchored by the uh, presentation of that individual allele. Um, and so what we did was we said, let's find all the different observed haplotype frequencies from allelefrequencies.net, and let's look across all those different haplotypes and anchoring that to a given one. So for instance, for AO202, we said, how, how many haplotypes of data could, do we have from allelefrequencies.net? And we saw that there are about 218 different haplotypes that contain the AO202 allele. And what you see here is a distribution where on the x-axis you have each different haplotype there in order of presentation. On the y-axis you're looking at the relative percent of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, proteome. And this is overall, so aggregate. So that's combining the presentation from all six alleles in terms of lumping unique peptides, not just if there were four, allele, four, four peptides presenting from one allele and four peptides from another, that wouldn't necessarily just summatively give you eight. We'd actually cross compare those and say, oh, maybe that gives you seven or six, for instance. Uh, based on how many unique peptides there were presented. Anyway, what you see here is, for instance, the overall pattern of presentation is re largely reflected by the, the dominant uh, allele. Um, uh, here, AO202 gives you a 21% um, uh, approximately presentation of SARS-CoV-2 uh, proteome. And then on average, when you look at the full um, haplotype, of that 23% of the, the proteome is ultimately presented um, there are some allele, some allele combinations in full haplotype that give you upwards of close to 40%, um, but that's, again, only one or two uh, different haplotypes in large part, um, right? The overall, the overall distribution is a little bit towards the lower side, similarly for B and for C. Um, but then when you look, uh, so this is the column on the left with the relatively good quote-unquote alleles. When you look at the quote-unquote bad alleles on the right, you see that there's a, a much more dearth of presentation. Certainly, again, some uh, haplotype combinations can be, uh, can be well presented, but again, um, the overall uh, average presentation, when you hold, when you, when you have a haplotype that has, for instance, A25 or B46 or C102, um, is generally much uh, lower by, by several fold um, than other individuals who have quote unquote good alleles. So we said, okay, well, that's all interesting. Um, what happens when we think about the relative conservation? In particular, we were wondering, um, you know, people are exposed to other coronaviruses very commonly. There are several known human coronaviruses, and the, the ones that are listed here are ones that people may have exposure to. So for instance, HKU1, OC43, T29E, and NL63. These are four uh, very, very common um, coronaviruses. Upwards of 30% of the population may have been exposed at different times. And they cause the common human cold. Um, so the thought was, well, you know, is there or are there any components of SARS-CoV-2 that may be cross-reactive to um, the components of the common human cold that may give an individual a leg up potentially on, um, on an immune response? And can we actually dissect which components of the SARS-CoV-2 proteome were more conserved, less conserved, and therefore uh, try to suss out um, which components may be more essential for an immune response. Um, and so we did that across all known alpha and beta coronaviruses. We looked for conservation, and we also looked at the conservation track just shown here, 
among known human coronaviruses. You see just two uh, windows um, looking at membrane protein, looking at ORF1AB polyprotein. This is the heel case component within the polyprotein. And you see in, in red kind of highlights a couple of um, uh, linear uh, conserved sequences um, showing, you know, almost 100% 100, 100 conservation in some areas and, you know, very significant conservation in others. Oops, skipped one slide too many. Uh, we looked then at just the conserved areas when we did this analysis across SARS-CoV-2 and found that the same type of pattern that we saw before looking at the entire proteome was uh, reflected in this uh, more conserved subset of the proteome that essentially that HLA types gave a differential capacity to present the uh, proteome. And indeed, there were 89 HLA alleles that showed uh, very, very poor um, uh, uh, binding affinity, for instance, 56 of them, um, including uh, HLA-B4601, uh, again, had 0% uh, capacity to present any of the, the conserved sequences. Um, again, the, we see at left the global allele frequency for these different HLA types, and we don't see really any relationship between the two. And so indeed, there's really no at least apparent global selective pressure to present conserved coronavirus epitopes. Um, so uh, really, it's, it's um, uh, a, a very, uh, I wouldn't say random because there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, uh, you know, ancestral hierarchies and, and, and migration patterns, and everything goes into all this, but overall a wide distribution globally in terms of the capacity to present. So we kind of finally went into a little bit of pseudo epidemiology here, again, not trying to overinterpret any data, but just to be a little bit suggestive, we said, well, listen, if, if different HLA alleles are able to present the virus differentially, how well um, are these alleles uh, represented across the globe? And we use allelefrequencies.net in this case to model where these HLA types lived. Uh, and again, this is a you know, lot of asterisks around this in terms of, and caveats, in terms of where the data is coming from, simply because allelefrequencies.net is not a, a, a comprehensive look at the HLA distribution across the world, and it's not a deep dive. However, it is somewhat representative. And so we found that there was geographic variability. Um, and indeed, that there were some endemic HLA types. For instance, B4601, which I've highlighted several times now, is more endemic in Southeast Asia. But there are other allele types. For instance, AO202, while it's 1.1% globally, is upwards of 10%, for instance, in, in, in Western uh, Africa. But there's, uh, you know, overall here, you see the maps of distribution of these different HLA types. Again, on the left, the three quote-unquote good alleles that I showed you before and the right, the four quote unquote bad alleles that I showed you before in terms of where they're located um, uh, uh, globally. Again, we did this analysis for all 145 uh, HLA types and we published this um, uh, in, in the supplement uh, of our, our um, uh, journal of virology paper, um, uh, which is out now and available. Um, uh, and happy to discuss all these details, but there is a lot of, a lot of limitations to our work as well. And I wanna be very clear and transparent about this. Obviously, it is an in silico study. In, indeed, it's a theoretical one, more hypothesis generating, or at least hypothesis supporting, I would say. Um, we really only studied a limited set of 145 well-studied alleles. There are plenty of others. There's thousands of HLA alleles, indeed. And we, you know, we didn't even look at um, uh, uh, other um, uh, MHC types, for instance, MHC class 2. So this is all just confined to MHC class 1. Um, there's also limitations in the MHC binding affinity tools that we were using. That is to say that these are all um, models trained on real world data. However, any model, right, it has its flaws and, and shortcomings and the tools are not perfectly, uh, perfectly uh, predictive. So there's inherently gonna be some errors and false positives and whatnot uh, in this approach. At a, at a global level though, right, we were just modeling overall percent capacity. And so, you know, any individual allele may or not, any individual type may or may not have been presented uh, particularly well, uh, but even getting things wrong at a, a low false positive rate shouldn't have affected the overall outcomes. Um, the last thing to note, not the last thing to note, but additional thing to note is that the binding affinity that we were using to predict is not equivalent to a T cell response, right? So, so just because something gets to the cell surface does not necessarily mean that a T cell is going to respond, and therefore um, we're still a step um, removed from um, being able to present. Um, I'm not going to go through all these other details here, but really um, there were several limitations to the paper. In the interest of time, I'm going to um, uh, end the study just noting that, um, end this talk just noting that there is um, emerging work that supports this idea 
Um, there um, was, for instance, this big New England Journal paper where they showed an ABO association that that is obviously um, flawed implicitly based on how that the study selected um, individuals as controls, et cetera. But um, uh, within that study, they did find that there was, this is buried in the supplement, mind you, but they found there was a slightly lower number of bound peptides in the most severe group uh, um, compared to other groups. Um, but they were only looking at six cases in this case, and it was obviously too small to draw robust conclusions. And so the jury is still out, long story short, but this is, a, I think, an exciting and compelling um, uh, situation, and uh, we'll see what emerges moving forward. That's really all I've got. Again, I, I, it looks like I ran over time just by a few minutes. I apologize. I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. Uh, let's have a, a few quick questions. I have one. Uh, how is this correlated with the uh, genetic diversity of SARS-CoV-2 virus? Uh... Yeah, that that's a great question. So, in, in case in case any of you missed the question, I, I heard probably about seventy-five percent of the question, but I believe the question was regarding um, uh, does this take into account together for space group? Here we define four groups here: group A, B, C, D, and of course we can see some uh, subgroups with a big group here, like a subgroup A in the A or subgroup B in the B, C here. But uh, one point is uh, those four groups or even the subgroups, they show mutually exclusive in the, in the distribution. And of course, as, as we already seen, different countries, they may have a different group of SNFs too. And we listed the four colors to represent the A, B, C, D groups of SNFs from a previous slides. And you can see most the country, they have multiple SNFs, groups of SNFs, and but only few like Italy, they only have us A and C, and, and also group D, seems only in the country like England, Wales, and Germany, even though we have an idea what's going on there. But still, we can see different countries and the areas show distinct uh, distribution pattern here. And also, we know the number of SNFs may the percentage of SNFs may change over time. So here we did an investigation with, on the distinct on the temporal evolution pattern, and we found that here shows a four group of SNFs we identified A, B, C, D, and you can see for group A in the early in the early stage almost no such a SNF were observed, but right now it occupied over ninety nine percent of new patients for in June. And for other three groups, even we have no idea why the first group shows, of, I mean, like the group B SNFs show the early, appear the higher frequency at the early stage, like the January 2020, but it's almost diminishing in the later stage. And also like a C and a B with a very similar pattern of B, group B, but as I said, we have no idea what's going on in the, February 2020 and February of March 2020, and why there is a peak time here? Because the samples we collect all are genome sequence, whole genome sequence samples, and there is some bias or very limited number at the early stage. That's the challenge we, we have. But as we mentioned, the four group of SNFs, they show mutually exclusive exclusive but still we observed some over some level of overlap between four groups of course you may add and we have no idea what's going on it might suggest a possible core infection or potential homogeneous recombination of the SARS-CoV-2 genome in different environment or with a specific uh, viral host but uh, why there is a very few number of with the overlap that my guess is uh, this is the consequence of quarantine and the lockdown policy enforced after the uh, spread of COVID nineteen. And also, we have to acknowledge, we have to thank to social distance and the wear and the face mask 
policies and which can be very effective in reducing the, reducing the chance of core infections. And as I mentioned, and also as people already know, and there is a similarity between SARS-CoV-2 and the bad coronavirus. Here we pick up four bad coronavirus from uh, collected from China, red G, uh, red G13 and the other three. And we know and the red G13 and the RM Yunlan collected from Yunlan, they are quite similar to SARS-CoV-2, the whole genome in terms of sequence similarity. It's about only 4% difference between red G13 and SARS-CoV-2. But for other two bad, they may have a about 11% difference. And then right now, and from SARS-CoV-2, we already have observed about 40% genome location with mutations. If we focus on the size where the bad coronavirus different, are different from Wuhan 1, as we used as a reference genome, we found that the ratio of the SNFs is much higher, significantly higher compared to the whole genome. It's more like they have a bias or preference for the site where bad COVID coronavirus are different from Wuhan 1. Particularly, we know if one site has a mutation, for example, the site, the original sequence of Wuhan 1, the reference genome sequence, the, the nucleotide here is A. If it's random change, then there is a potentially 33% chance they can be CGT. So when we look at the site, the, 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 uh, when we look at the nucleotide substitution on the side where bad different from Wuhan 1, for other three bats, looks like the ratio is kind of random, it's about 30%, around 30%. But only for red, G, red TG13, we found that the ratio is significantly higher, it's almost 45% for that one. In other words, for low side, the SARS-CoV-2 genome sequence at the low side, the nucleotide of SARS-CoV-2, either be Wuhan 1, same as Wuhan 1, or same as red DG13, particularly for 45, uh, sorry, for 54 high frequency SNFs I already showed you from previous slides, we found the eight SNFs were on the side, ITG13 are different from Wuhan 1, seven out of them is either Wuhan 1 or red 13, red TG 13. And uh, of course, uh, most of them are non-synonymous uh, um, mutations. Only one T28144C is a synonymous mutation. And the two young geniuses, uh, Sui Fang and Kai Lin Li, are PhD, both are PhD students in my lab. They used uh, all the mutation data to develop the website which we call the Global Evaluation of SARS-CoV-2 Sequences of GIS. They use, they develop a different tools and options, functions in the website. For example, we can, when you, when you enter the genomic location, you may find more detailed information about the mutation on such side. It shows whether it's a non-synonymous, or synonymous, where is the location of this one and the worldwide status, like distribution of these mutations. And also we provide another more detailed uh, distribution for the United States only. And the, when you click the, the time series, it tends out to show you the occurrence, this occurrence ratio around the time from January, from early, like uh, December last year to the most recent. And for this one, as we already know, and the occurrence ratio is high, higher, and the, like you say, for the, in last month, almost 99% of samples correct in this month, they have uh, this mutation. And also other more functions like a genome region search, a country area search, a concurrence search. A concurrence search is a short correlation between mutations and also SNF birth query and which have different functions. But what's, what's the function of that one? And why when people are talking about the fighting COVID-19 and everybody thinking about the vaccine design, 
I'm not an expert in vaccine design, but the principle I learned from other people is the uh, idea of vaccine must have a strong immunogenicity with a useful T lymphocyte or B lymphocyte and less immunotoxicity. And I was told the evolution conservation of virus sequence is a very important factor to be think about, to be considered because the can the evolution conservation may influence the effectiveness of vaccine. And the most uh, vaccines they designed looks like focus on spike protein and also OR3A and somewhere in our area. And it turns out our, soft, our website, the GIS, can do some information help for the vaccine design. For example, here is a one vaccine people proposed this year, and it's on the spike protein. When they enter the position on the spike on, on our website, the geese, the geese will tell for this region how many samples they have uh, mutations from 10,000 samples we collected, sequence the samples. And for this one, we can see and the most of them, no, no dot here means no mutation. Here, the y axis is the log scale. Zero means only one mutation, and the one means 10 mutations. I mean, like 10 samples with mutations, and 1.5 is around 20. So, for this vaccine design, you can see mature site with a no or very low mutations, a little bit higher at the last part of here. Well, when we compare another, another uh, vaccine published recently, which is on the uh, OIF3A, we find that the mutation rate seems quite high than the first one. Of course, we cannot judge which one is better just based on the mutation rate, but at least our website gives, can give people, give investigators an idea how the conservation score for this space group target region looks like. And another function is, an, and uh, we, the geese can tell people which, what's the newly emerging SNFs for each month of your interest. For example, if we look at uh, June 2020, and uh, the geese will, when you enter the month, the geese, the website will give you what cloud of the new mutation identified in this month, in the month, and the larger size of the mutation, the more samples carrying this mutation. So for if you click A2292C, then you may find that this is a non synonymous mutation on the OF1A, and from the distribution pattern, you can see this is a mutation come from, came from the country India, and there is a 58 SNFs on this mutation in the month of June 2020. Actually, India had, uh, we collected about 250 samples from India in June. So you can see about one quarter of India samples in June with carry these mutations, which is quite significant. So people may keep in mind what's going on there. And also another example is uh, the second one, G2036T, is all, also another non synonymous mutation on the, on the protein OIF1AB. And when you click the distribution pattern on the USA, you find the most, mo almost all of them come from the Wisconsin, from the samples in Wisconsin. And it's about 20% of Wisconsin samples corrected in June have had this mutation. So, and uh, this is a uh, very quick work uh, in our lab. And I think uh, the, the, our, our study may provide a very useful information for the community to fight uh, COVID-19. And our work, because we did a systematic investigation on the SARS-CoV-2 and the single nucleotide variations. From our analysis, you can see, we identified four main mutually excluded clusters and of course, uh, some consequent uh, subcluster of SNFs, uh, which are mutually exclusive too. And the lows of four major cluster, four major clusters of uh, uh, SNFs covered over 96% of worldwide samples, uh, which are predominated in different countries' areas. 
they may represent the different viral strains. And uh, the important thing is uh, these four main mutually exclusive classes also have a uh, distinguished the temporal evolution pattern. And even though we observe the rare cases carry multiple group of SNFs simultaneously, which may stand for possible cause infection or potential homogeneous recombination of the SARS-CoV-2 in different uh, in space environments. And the interesting thing, interest, one interesting finding is uh, when we compare the overlap between SARS-CoV-2 SNFs and the site of bad uh, COVID coronavirus sequence different from reference genome, we found the SARS-CoV-2 SNFs tend to occur on the side of bad coronavirus sequence different from the reference genome, particularly the nucleotide sub substitution among SARS-CoV-2 genome tend to switch between Wuhan 1 and the bad red, red G13 coronavirus. Even without the uh, stronger evidence, we cannot make any conclusion. But still, this result may suggest major virus strains might exist between Wuhan 1 and the Red G13 coronavirus, or some intermediate host between them. And in the last part, I show the application of a newly developed website case by my lab, which can be helpful which can provide helpful information for like vaccine design and uh, mutation study and also monitor and analyze uh, SARS-CoV-2 mutations. And uh, I would like to acknowledge the labs and the several few, several members in my lab involved in this project, Shen Liu and Su Yu Fang, Kylie Lee, as you already seen. And also I thank my collaborators from uh, uh, Johns Hopkins and my colleague in Indiana University, Dr. Lei Yang, and also my long-term collaborator, Chang Den Hu from Purdue University. And finally, I would thank some funding support from NIH and Water Cancer Foundation. I'm happy to take uh, any question. Thank you. Let's have a, a few uh, quick questions. Yeah. How do you adjust for the sample bias? Uh, the sample bias we adjust is so uh, we did uh, some distribution like for the local and the population divided by population or the case uh, like uh, Johns Hopkins University provided. And for example, and for the December 2019, all samples from China Wuhan, that's understandable. But in January 2020, and we got about uh, 250 samples from China, very few from Wuhan, less than 20%. So definitely we see a bias for any reason or unknown reason. In the later stage, we find a much more sample from the United States. And also it kind of correlated with the number of cases confirmed in the United States. So it's okay, yeah. But at the early, just in the early stage, it's hard to make a conclusion about the, the which mutation first emerged from which country is hard to make such a solid conclusion. Yeah, that's the reason why we why we don't want to take a, like a similar analysis like a, other people already done like a phylogenic network because of the biased sample sampling. And also, I have to mention and actually we are looking for some clinical data associated with uh, sequence, genome sequence data. We try to identify which mutation is more correlated with uh, like a mortality, something like a clinical symptom, something like that. We try to build up a correlation between them. So if anybody has clinic data with, and uh, so you are welcome to contact us. Yeah. Thank you. Uh... Okay, in the interest of time, we are going to go to the paper uh, 20, number 28. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, see whether I can play the pre-recorded video. Hello, my name is Vicky Zhang and I'll 
Uh, can you hear this? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, then I'm going to uh, yeah, start playing this. Discussing our work on identifying taxonomic units in metagenomic DNA streams. Metagenomic data sets consist of several microbial communities. This is why one of the most common tasks in metagenomics is the identification of operational taxonomic units, also referred to as OTUs. OTUs are represented by clusters of highly similar DNA reads. Metagenomic data sets often come from environmental samples. We want to analyze these samples using a portable DNA sequencer. In this research, we will be using the Oxford Nanopore Technologies Minion. It is small enough to fit into the palm of your hand, and it has a USB port to connect to your devices. Portable DNA sequencers will revolutionize the DNA sequencing analysis pipeline. We can start off by first attaching the portable sequencing device to a battery powered mobile host like a cell phone or a laptop. The DNA sequencer will be responsible for DNA sequencing while the host device is responsible for DNA processing. The sequencer can deliver in real time raw signals represented DNA molecules. These raw signals are then taken and immediately base called on the host machine which is the cell phone or laptop, and yield that actual DNA reads, which are strings consisting of nucleotides that we are used to processing. We can then take these DNA reads, which are just strings over the four letter alphabet of nucleotides and do downstream analysis. The downstream analysis that we will be doing is identifying OTUs. We will be doing this in real time meaning that we are processing an active stream of reads on a host device. We plan on using connected components to identify OTUs. Connected components in assembly graphs have been demonstrated as a robust representation of OTUs in previous research. To formalize our problem, let R represent an input stream of DNA reads generated in real time by a portable DNA sequencer. Our reads are ordered based on when they are emitted by the sequencer. Given our reads, we can construct an overlap graph G consisting of vertices, which represent reads, and edges representing significant overlaps between the suffix of one read and the prefix of another. Here, a significant overlap indicates that two reads have been derived from neighboring portions of an underlying unknown genome. To summarize, the nodes of our graph consist of reads and the edges consist of overlaps between those reads. Since we are processing a stream of reads, the state of our graph changes with each incoming read. Our goal is to dynamically identify and maintain a set of weakly connected components CI in our dynamic graph at any given point time I. Identifying connected components is a simple and well studied problem. However, we have to do this in a memory efficient way because we have limited memory and limited storage on cell phones and laptops or any portable host device. We also have to do this in a computationally efficient way because we have to deliver results in real time. And we can expect to receive over 100 reads per second over the course of a several hour long experiment. Therefore, we will identify and maintain connected components by exploiting the fact that in a typical DNA sequencing experiment, many DNA reads share overlaps and thus provide redundant information. Therefore, we can eliminate reads that contain redundant information without disconnecting the underlying overlap graph structure, and hence without losing any critical information to our underlying graph. We will refer to nodes that correspond to redundant reads as transitive, and the removal of a transitive node as a transitive closure. By identifying and eliminating transitive nodes for each incoming read, we simplify the graph on which we have to perform connected component identification by limiting node degree, 
We also reduce the number of reads and hence the number of graph nodes we have to maintain in memory. And we also prevent redundant information from ever entering our graph because we immediately eliminate it upon discovery. Since we never want redundant information in our graph, we will check transitive nodes that may have been introduced with each incoming read. In this example, read J is transitive because we detected that its read information is completely contained in read K and read I. Depending on the ordering that we receive reads K, J, and I, the presence of the transitive node will be revealed in, its, in different ways. If a node's incoming neighbors share an edge, one of them is transitive. For example, if read I is the last node that we received in the three reads, then we know that there is a transitive node among the incoming nodes because the incoming neighbors of node I share an edge. If read K is the last read that we received of the three reads, then we know that there is a transitive node among the outgoing neighbors because the outgoing neighbors of node K share an edge. Finally, if read J is, is the last read we receive of the three reads, then we know that the current node is a transitive node because an incoming neighbor shares an edge with an outgoing neighbor. If all goes well, the neighbors of the transitive nodes are connected to one another. This allows us to safely remove transitive nodes without disconnecting the underlying graph structure. Since we never disconnect the underlying graph structure when we remove nodes, we can use union find to maintain connected components. Union find is a tried and true data structure for incrementally maintaining connected components. Union find normally doesn't work with node removals. However, we never remove arbitrary nodes, so we are able to use it here. In this presentation thus far, I have not mentioned the challenges of handling real-world data. In our paper, we discuss the real-world challenges of our approach and how we handle them. So please refer to our paper. This figure that has been shown throughout our presentation is actually how the overlap graphs of one of our data sets look. They, this data set contained eight different species and we were able to recover nine components. Notice that one of the components at the bottom right is slightly smaller. This is the tail end of a repetitive genome that got segmented. This is not an artifact of our trans closures, but of the repetitive nature of the genome itself. Since transitive closures inherently remove reads from memory, we were able to reduce the number of reads stored and therefore the number of nodes by tens of thousands. We were able to prune hundreds of thousands of edges from our overlap graph through transitive closures as well. We were able to show that overlap graphs processed with transitive closures also fall in following exponential distribution. This property allows us to uphold theoretical runtime guarantees of constant time operations, which we discuss more in our paper. This means that our method introduces little overhead to our DNA sequencing pipeline. Thank you for your time. And as stated before, please refer to our paper for more details on this project, as this presentation is only meant to be a high level overview. Our application is open to the public. Please feel free to poke around. If you have any questions, I have included my contact information. Thank you again for your time. Finally, I want to acknowledge the National Science Foundation for supporting this work. Thank you so much. Uh, a few quick questions. Uh, Dr. Chen, are you here? Sorry, who are you looking for? 
Oh, uh, are, are you Dr. Uh, VT Chen? Uh, I'm not a doctor. I don't have my PhD yet, but yes, I'm here. Oh, I see. Oh, that's why. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, a, a few questions. So, uh... Oh, sure. Did you have any questions? Yeah, I, I was asking. The, the, the people, uh, participant had a question. So. Oh, yeah. But uh, how 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 did you implement this? Uh, I guess I uh, didn't see, didn't look at your GitHub. Uh. Yeah, so all of the code is written in C++, and the reason why we implemented everything in C++ is because we eventually want to be able to put our program on mobile devices, um, so that we can actually have like portable sequencing analysis. I see. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, if not, thank you. Uh, let's uh, let, let me see. Uh, so the next one will be let's see. Okay, the next will be a uh, uh, submission number th uh, thirty-three. Hello, my name is Hayo Mehet, and I am a PhD student from the Federal University of Amazonas in Brazil. I'm here to present my abstract entitled Using Outliers to Find Genes That Are Relevant for Basal Breast Cancer. First, let me introduce to all of them. Among the breast cancer subtypes, basal is the one with the worst prognosis. Usually, the cancer subtype classification problem is tackled using a single set of genes, for example, the well-known PAM50 gene list. But this approach may not suffice to understand each subtype's particularities. Doing that, quick diagnosing basal subtype and finding important genes related to it is crucial to properly and effectively treat patients. With that established our hypothesis, genes that are consistent outliers, uncommonly underexpressed or overexpressed, are possible candidates to efficiently characterize the basal subtype. So we propose new methods based on outlier genes. Our method consists in three main steps. The first one is the outlier detection using interquartile range, the IQR. The second step is find the intersection of genes that are outliers in the analyzed subtype and a set of genes that are not outliers in the other subtypes. And the third step is cluster the sample into two groups using this set of genes. In our proposed method, the first step is outlier detection using interquartile range. We separate our data set in smaller data sets, each one containing only samples of the respective subtype. Here, we will demonstrate all the process in one data set. For each subtype, we calculated the outlier genes using the IQR. The median and the interquartile range for each row is calculated. The outlier genes are defined as any values more than a multiple of the IQR above or below the median. The genes that appear in the blue bar of the distribution. In our method, we use the default multiply of the IQR that is 1.5. After the calculation, we find all the genes that present an uncommonly expressed value, both underexpressed or overexpressed, for each sample in each subtype. To identify if a gene can be considered as an outlier, in our approach, this gene must be an outlier in at least 65% of the subtype samples. We apply this threshold because there are some genes that are an outlier in only few samples. So applying a low threshold would result in a vast list of genes. And one of our 
objective is to find a small set of genes. In the end of our calculation, we have all the genes that we consider as an outlier for each one of the subtypes. After finding those genes that are outlier, we validate them using the isolation forest algorithm. In the second step, we find the intersection of the set of genes that are outliers in the basal subtype and the set of genes that are not outlier in the other subtypes. Here, we will call the genes that are not outlier as normal genes. After finding the genes that are considered outliers in the first step, we find the genes that are considered normal for the other subtypes. The blue bar in the middle of the distribution. In our approach, we consider a gene as normal if this gene is presented in at least 50% of the samples. After that, we intersect the genes that are outlier in basal subtype and the set of genes that are considered normal in the other subtypes. Intersecting the genes that are outliers for the basal subtype and are normal for the other subtypes, we find a set of genes that can distinguish the subtypes because they present different expression values among the subtypes. And when a gene expresses this difference among the subtypes, it's a premise that this gene may be good to characterize the analyzed subtype. In our case, the basal after the intersection of basal outliers with normal genes from the other subtypes, we found our set of genes. The last step is to cluster the samples into two groups using the obtaining the set of genes in the second step. Now I will present the experiments. On the experiments, we validated our proposed method on a breast cancer data set. After that, we compared our proposed method with the well-known Tom Fifth gene list. To evaluate the proposal, we used the data set from the Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium, the CPTEC. This data set consists of four well-accepted subtypes, basal, HER2, luminal A, and luminal B. Each of the seven service samples has the expression of more than 16,000 genes, the RNA portion. We validated our proposed method using k-means for the clustering step. We were able to fully classify all basal samples in the same group using only 41 genes. All the HER2, luminal A, and luminal B samples were grouped in the other cluster. After successfully finding a subset that separates basal from non-basal samples, we greedily remove genes with the highest variance. Remove genes that are more heterogeneous, we improved our clustering by lowering to only 30 genes and still able to group all basal samples in the same cluster and the other subtype samples in the other cluster. We also compared our outlier based method we improved with variance with the Pumphil gene list using the same CIPTEC dataset. And this experiment was also using K means. As you can see, while our proposed method was capable to cluster all basal samples in the same group, the Pumphil gene list grouped the basal samples in the same cluster with HER2, luminal A, and luminal B samples. One thing that's interesting to notice is that only one gene from our gene set intersects with the pan genes, the FOXY1, that's widely known to be related to breast cancer. After finding these good results, we improved the method by changing the gene filtering method. Instead of variance, we used the Rexiv feature elimination widely used for discovering new biomarkers and improving interpretation for biological data. Using the RFE, we were able to reduce to only 11 genes out of more than 16,000 and still cluster all basal samples in the same cluster. None of the 11 genes found by our approach intersects with the Banfield gene list.
we also try to validate our proposed method on the classification problem. On this experiment, we used two CIPTEC datasets, one for training and one for test. We used the SVMS classifier and did a binary classification, basal samples and non-basal samples. Comparing the results with the PAN15 list, both set of genes were able to correct classify 17 out of 18 basal samples and fully classify all non-basal samples. But it's worth notice that our proposed method used only 10 genes while the PAN15 uses all the 50 genes. As conclusion, we proposed a new method for identifying basal subtype relevant genes based on outlier genes. The results are very promising, in which we were able to fully group all basal samples in the same cluster using only 11 genes out of more than 16,000. Our method also outperforms the well known PAN15 gene list when trying to cluster the samples from basal subtype and also outperforms in the classification problem by achieving the same results using less genes. For future direction, we intend to replicate the strategy to the other three subtypes to identify the best subsets that cluster each subtype. We are also working on extending the outlier approach to identify the proteins related to these subtypes of breast cancer. Thank you for your attention. Here are my contact information. Questions? Is, is the presenter here? Or? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm here. Oh. Uh, uh, have you tried a permutation test? Well, sorry, which which test? Permutation uh, to see how uh, specific uh, or accurate. If no. you oh. uh, actually no, I didn't. But uh, I can try to to use these to to see the the results. But I, I didn't try it. Try. Uh, other questions? Uh, if not, uh, it looks like we uh, let's have a five minutes uh, session break and then we come back. Uh, that will be uh, what? Yeah, uh, Dr. Chen. So I think uh, Jake is here. So maybe after five minute breaks, and we can come back and like Jake. Because Jacob will be the second, uh, the first right. speaker of the second talk, so he can give the opening remarks, and then in the meanwhile, give the talk. Also. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it's like uh, let's come back at uh, uh, one zero two p.m. Eastern time. That would be, I guess, uh, whatever time. <laughs> so yeah, time to... about five minutes later. So we. Will yeah, yeah. Five minutes later. Yeah. Let's come back five minutes later. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so Jake, are, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, maybe after five minutes, uh, 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 it will be your turn, right? Okay. Sure, so five minutes before the clock. Yeah, okay. thank you. See you, everyone, in five minutes. <laughs> 